we're going to cover some concepts that I think might turn out to be essential for software developers in this new age of AI. No previous experience with machine learning is necessary. We're gonna keep things really simple. Now, there are two main things that you're going to wanna be able to do as a software developer in this new age of AI. Number one is to be able to integrate large language models into the software that you build. It's hard to fully comprehend the number of language model powered features that developers are going to be asked to implement in the next few years. The other main thing that you want to be able to do is to leverage language models to help you with your development workflow. And as a bonus, you'll probably wanna be able to do all of this without relying on a cloud-based service that's going to charge you per request. But that's kind of dependent on your specific situation. It's tempting to basically outsource the AI such that you're just sending prompts and requests to an API and getting responses. But with a basic understanding of some of the concepts around large language models, it's actually pretty straightforward to incorporate free open source models into your application such that all you have to pay for is the compute power necessary to run them, whether that be on your local machine or in your production fleet. Many of the free open source models have really impressive performance to the point where they're very worthy of incorporating into many customer facing products. This video is going to focus primarily on the concepts around transformers and language models that you need to understand in order to leverage open source pre-trained models. At the end, you'll have state of the art AI running in about 10 lines of Python code. Even if you don't like Python, it's a good starting point. Once you understand the basics, you can quickly pivot to a different language like Rust if you'd like to. Let's cut right to the chase and write a quick Python program to load an open source language model locally so we can give it prompts. Okay, so ultimately we wanna have our language model answer the question that we've stored here in a string what color is the undoubtedly beautiful sky? I know that seems to be an awkward phrase, but hey, awkward happens to be a specialty of mine. We can't feed a string directly into our model, unfortunately, because to generate some output, language models actually take a bunch of vectors as input. By vectors, we're basically talking about n-dimensional arrays of floating point numbers. Okay, what? How the heck do we convert our sentence, what color is the undoubtedly beautiful sky, into a bunch of vectors, and what's the relationship between the original text and those vectors? Well, it might cost you a few tokens to find out. Seriously though, the process is pretty straightforward. First, we have to talk a little more about transformers. The current AI revolution can largely be traced back to a 2017 paper called Attention is All You Need, which offered some insights into the optimal way to wire together neural networks for the purpose of language translation tasks. The authors call this architecture the transformer, and it allowed for much more efficient training compared to previous approaches to language translation. More efficient training means the opportunity to train with more data, which leads to more performant models. The NLP community eventually realized that the transformer architecture could also be leveraged to achieve breakthrough performance in other tasks like question answering, text summarization, and so on. Now we need to talk about hugging face. The first thing to realize is that large language models that emulate human intelligence can take enormous amounts of compute resources to train, potentially millions of US dollars worth, something that isn't realistic for individual developers or small companies to have access to. Hugging Face has a repository of open source pre-trained language models that you can download for free and run locally. They even created a Python package called Transformers that facilitates loading and prompting of those models. To say it's a popular package would be an understatement. At the time I'm making this video, it has about 92,000 stars on GitHub. There is a Rust port of Transformers called Rust BERT that I actually did a video on a while back. I'll have a link to that at the end of the video. Hugging Face does also provide REST APIs for using language models in its repository, which allow you to completely outsource your model usage to them, similar to what you'd do if you're using OpenAI's APIs. As you might expect, if you go down that route, it'll cost you though. Okay, now back to the code. I mentioned we need to convert this string to numeric vectors somehow. The first step toward converting the text to vectors is to perform what's called tokenization on it. So let's grab the auto tokenizer class from the transformers module. If you haven't already, you need to do a pip install transformers to grab that. And then we have our input text. We're gonna specify a model name and that's gonna be Google Flan T5 base. This string here is a hugging face model name. So it's prefixed by kind of a namespace. In this case is Google and then the model. And there's actually a few flavors of Flan T5, there's base, there's small, large, extra large, and double extra large. And base is kind of like the middle-ish model. It's relatively small compared to the larger ones. And so it'll run on most local machines, even without GPU acceleration. So we're gonna kick things off with that. And later we'll see how it performs compared to the other larger models. Now the story behind auto tokenizer is there's a different tokenizer class for different tokenizers associated with different models. Transformers has several tokenizer classes. Auto tokenizer, will will automatically pick the correct tokenizer class based on the model name. So we can go ahead and grab our tokenizer and then pass in the model name. And now we can do tokens equals tokenizer tokenize and then the input text. And we can print. So let's see what that looks like. Now we can see our tokens from the original string, 
what color is the undoubtedly beautiful sky. You can see it broke one word into two tokens, undoubtedly become uh, became un and doubtedly. And you also see that most words are prefixed with an underscore. That just indicates that there it's the start of a new word because as you can see here, some words might be broken into multiple tokens. I won't go into too much detail on why some words are broken into multiple tokens, but long story short, it's for efficiency purposes. The other thing to note is that all the tokens that you pass to the model to generate text need to have been in the training data when that model was pre-trained. That's something else that the tokenizer does. It makes sure that the input text is tokenized, but basically each of these tokens maps to an index in the input embeddings of the model. I'll show you that in a, in a second. And the model doesn't actually take the tokens directly. It actually takes a list of token IDs. So we can actually grab the token IDs by doing IDs equals uh, tokenizer dot convert tokens to IDs. And we pass in the tokens and we can see what that looks like. Okay, so we can see each token has a one-to-one -one mapping with some ID. And this is closer to what we're going to need to pass to the model generate function to generate the answer. But we're not quite there yet. The other thing you might be wondering is why do we need to call these two separate functions to get the input string into the form that we need to get the question answered by the model? As luck would have it, there is one function that does both. And it's actually implemented as the call method for tokenizer. So I can just do uh, tokenizer line and return tensors maybe make this bigger here turn tensors equals pt for pytorch pytorch is the package under the hood that transformers is using to do all the number crunching basically is the best way to put it and so the call method of tokenizer takes things one step further and it actually makes a pytorch tensor what's called a pytorch tensor out of the token ids and we can see that there. It's kind of hard to read, but yeah, it's similar to what we saw before, but it's a tensor. And then we also have an attention tensor, which I won't go into here. This is the form that we need to actually generate an answer to the, our question. I mentioned that the input embeddings in the Flan T5 base model have an entry for each of these token IDs. You don't need to know any of this to actually leverage the model, but I thought it'd be interesting to take a look under the hood and see what those vectors look like. Those input embeddings are part of the model, so we actually need to grab our model at this point. And this auto model for sequence to sequence is similar to auto tokenizer. It's gonna pick the right class for us based on the name of the model. And we're gonna do from pre-trained and then our model name. And we also have to import that. Once we have our model, we can do input and then we can index into those embeddings with the token IDs that we have in our tokens to see the actual vectors of the tokens that came from our original input string. I'm going a little deeper than what you need to know to actually use this model. So bear with me for a minute. If you don't care about this, we'll get to the practical stuff in a second here. The input embeddings that come from this function are a special embedding structure, and we can index into that. We can pass a tensor into that. So we can grab our tensor of token IDs and pass it into this input embeddings or index into input embeddings using our token IDs. So we should get at this point are the actual vectors associated with the tokens that came from our input string. Our, our tokens tensor is actually called tokens, not input. So I fixed that. So here we can see our actual vectors for each of our tokens. Not something you'd likely want to look at, <laughs> but you can see it if you're interested. These are 768 dimensional vectors for each token. So that means the model in the input embeddings captures 768 features that it uses to kind of determine the semantic meaning of that word outside of the context that it's used. It, it actually has other vectors internally in the model that represent a word's meaning based on its position in the input sentence or the input text. So yeah, that's what these vectors look like. I actually maybe took this a little bit too far and made a three-dimensional plot of word vectors and of course the vectors are 768 dimensions but I use dimensionality reduction to reduce that to three dimensions so they can be visualized because 768 dimensions is pretty hard to visualize you can kind of see the clusterings that you might expect things like air and sky are near each other fire and blaze are near each other I put a bunch of kind of randomish words you know home and house are near each other cat and dog are near each other I don't know what's going going on with this cluster here because the vectors capture the semantic meaning of the word without any knowledge of the context in which their words used, they show up more or less close to each other on this three-dimensional plot. Okay, so we did get a little sidetracked there, but back to the practical stuff. So let's delete all this. 
and we can actually get our outputs. So at this point we have our model and our tokens. We can call model.generate and the double asterisk in Python. So this is gonna take all the fields in the inputs dictionary and make them parameter names and all the field values are gonna be assigned to those parameter names. And then outputs is actually gonna be tokens similar in a similar format to what we had as input. So we're gonna to have to decode those also using the tokenizer. Uh, so we can do tokenizer.batch decode. Uh, the reason it's batch is that you can pass multiple tensors of tokens and have them all decoded at once. But in our case, we only have one. So we'll just pass in outputs. We'll do skip special tokens. Special tokens are kind of artifacts that are generated by the model that you don't really need if you're just looking for human readable output text. So we'll set that to true. Oops, here I meant tokens, not inputs. Okay, we got this warning here because we're not setting a parameter that they recommend you setting, but if you look closely down here, we actually got our answer. Our answer is blue. This model knows that the sky is blue. Nice. Let's go ahead and try to get rid of this warning here. So we need to create a generation config. Take a step back a minute. This is all you need to generate text using a large language model. So that's pretty cool. This is only five lines of code. The next step is to make a read eval print loop. So each time you're loading this program, you're loading the model. And if the model's large, that might take a while. The T5 base model is actually pretty small. So it's relatively fast. But if you're using like double XL, you would definitely notice the loading time. It might be upwards of five to 10 minutes. So a read eval print loop would be nice because then you can, once the model's loaded, you can enter multiple prompts and get multiple responses. That's what we're gonna aim to do for the rest of the video. First, let's create a uh, generation config. The thing that it wanted us to set is max new tokens, which kind of dictates the number of tokens that can be in the response. And then we can go ahead and pass that config into our model generate function. Need to import that. Cool, so we got rid of our warning and we still got our answer blue. Nice, okay, so now the REPL part. We're gonna take input from standard in, so we're gonna import SYS. We're gonna make a read about print loop so we, we can take the tokenizer and the model out of that because we only need to create those once and model name as well. Um, and then our print, our redevel print loop, we can do four line in sys.standard in and indent those. And we can also put up, pull our generation config out of there. Uh, we can set that up prior to the loop. So just to show you what this looks like. Okay, let's go ahead and run this. If all goes well, we should be able to type a prompt into standard in and get a response. Uh, what is a common pet for humans to have? A dog, nice, cool. So now we have a read eval print loop with our model loaded. What are two common pets for humans to have? Cat and a dog, nailed that one. Again, again, this is not the smallest flavor of Google Flan T5, but it's the second smallest. So we shouldn't expect miraculous results here. You, you can also see it's responding pretty quickly. And this is actually not using any GPU acceleration. So this is a pretty kind of palatable model to run on pretty much any personal computer. What does a rocket need to get into orbit? Rocket's fuel, okay, that's right. <laughs> what is a beverage that is hot? Oh, <laughs> it flubbed that one. Uh, what is the mission that went to the moon? Okay, I don't think there was an Apollo 18. I think it was 17 was the last one, right? I believe there's a movie called Apollo 18. <laughs> uh, what is the mission went to the moon, but didn't land on it? Oops, flubbed that one too. Okay, so you can see the limitations of the kind of smaller flavors of the language model. It gets the basic stuff right, but it flubs kind of anything more complicated than the very, very basic questions. Let's try a larger model and see how that performs. We're gonna change this to T5 XL. There is one larger, but I find that one, uh, it's XXL is the largest one, but I find that one takes a really long time to respond and the quality of the responses isn't that much better, at least in my testing than what I got from XL. So let's go with XL and try that. 
this model does take a little while to load, but we'll edit the loading time out. Now we're, we have the, the Google Flan T5 XL model loaded. Let's see it, how it does on the questions that the base flavor did not get correct. So what is a beverage? It's hot tea, okay, nice, that's better. Uh, what is a beverage that is hot but does not have caffeine? A little bit harder, tea? Uh, I guess that's kind of true. <laughs> uh, some tea doesn't. Well, okay. Uh, what is the mission that went to the moon? Paul 11. Nice. Okay. What is the mission that went to the moon, but didn't land on it? Oops. Flubbed that one. Okay, so what is the mission that tried to land on the moon but didn't? I rephrased it a little bit and I got it, okay. Okay, yeah, so you can see the responses get significantly better when you use the larger flavors of the model, but the loading time is more and the time to respond to each prompt will likely be more as well. The response time on my machine for the XL model is still very palatable. The XXL I found was not as palatable. It sometimes took a few minutes to respond. So XL for, for locally, running running locally, which you don't necessarily need to do, there's lots of ways to run this on a machine that has a GPU that can make this, this a lot faster, but that's that's one thing to play around with is, is the flavor of the model that you're using. The other thing to play around with is this generation config down here. Generation config actually has quite a few parameters that you can adjust. You might have noticed that some of the responses were not very GPT OpenAI like. They're even if they're correct, they're very dry and you know it, it kind of seem to use as few words as possible. You can play with generation config to encourage the model to be more creative or verbose. So if you wanted to get more GPT like responses, you could play with all the parameters of generation config. Hugging Face also has a really fantastic introductory course if you're interested in a bit more background after watching this video. Uh, linked will be down below in the description. If you are interested in doing something similar to what we showed in this video, but using Rust instead of Python, check out this other video where we do something similar using a Rust port of the Transformers package called Rust BERT. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.